All right. Now, if you remember from the announcements just a few minutes ago, uh, this is our, our soul winning surge week. And I'm going to be preaching a sermon this morning. It's called, It's All About Soul Winning. And if you're new to our church, if you've been here only a couple times, or you've been coming a little bit, um, but, but you haven't really been here a lot, uh, I just want to explain to you what, you know, the heart and soul and the lifeblood of this church is literally, it's all about soul winning. And, and I want to preach this message this morning is that, you know, hopefully this is what it's all about for you personally. It's not just for this church. It's for every single believer in Jesus Christ. When you think about what is your life really all about? What does your life consist of? What is your life? What is it that matters ultimately the most? That's more important than anything else in your whole life. You, know, you, you think about that for yourself and answer that question for yourself. But for me, the, the, the Lord Jesus Christ is the single most important thing in my life. He's the one that, that gave me eternal life when I deserve to die and go to hell. And, and the relationship that we have with our God ought to be number one. It ought to be our top priority. And the number one thing that God wants us to do is to win other people to Christ, that his house may be full. I mean, but the, the Bible says that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. It's God's will. God wants this to be done. But see, the thing is, he's put it on us. He's made it incumbent upon us to be the ones that preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we're going to get into that a little bit further. I want to, we started off here in Ephesians chapter 2. Hopefully this is familiar to you. This is our, we've, been, we've been studying this, and this has been our Bible memory passage for the past you know, 10 weeks. We've been working on Ephesians chapter 2. Let's start off rereading from verse number 1. The Bible says, And you hath he quickened, quickened means made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins. And see, this is setting up, this is going to get us in the right frame of mind where we need to be when we, when we read this passage and think about this. Hey, you were given life. You were dead in your trespasses and sins. But thank God, God quickened you. He made you alive. He gave you a, the gift of eternal life. Wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past, in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. You say, you're just like everyone else. Look, everyone's under this condemnation. There's no one that escapes us because we're all sinners. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. None of us are deserving of heaven. And we've all been here. We've all been there. We've all done that. That's, this is what he's saying here. Look at verse number four. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved, and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. What is more honoring and, and, and just worthy of our praise and our joy than that? We were dead in sins. We were undeserving. We failed. We've broken God's law. We deserve, punish. we deserve punishment, but God... In his, in his abundant mercy, he's rich in mercy, and his love toward us made it possible for us to be saved and to lift us up into heavenly places through our Lord Jesus Christ, to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Verse number seven, that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Very, very famous verses. This is, we use this often. And if you come out with a soul winning, you'll see we reference these verses all the time because the vast majority of people in the world today, the vast majority, I mean, I'd say over 90% of the people in one form or another think that they're going, if they believe that heaven is a real place, they think they're going to heaven based on how good they live. The vast majority of people have, have and, and even among people who call themselves Christians, the vast majority of people have this sense that God is a judge that's going to weigh out, hey, if I've gone to church, if I've prayed, if I've helped other people out, that the balance is going to be weighed with these good works versus my sins. My friends, that is not the truth, and hopefully everyone here understands that, that that is not the truth, that uh, the good works or the things that we do cannot outweigh the, the sins that we've committed in our life. 
and that all sin that we commit is worthy of a punishment of hell. And the only way we can escape that punishment is by receiving forgiveness through Jesus Christ. And we show people this because the Bible flat out says it has nothing to do with your works. But I don't want to stop here. And, and verse 10 is where we're going to actually be picking up and, and, and start the starting point for the sermon is found in verse 10, which just so happens to be our memory verse for this week. Most of you probably already have verses 8 and 9 memorized because we use that so often when we go out soul winning. But I want to focus in on verse number 10 this morning. The Bible says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. He saved us. He gave us great mercy. He loved us. He's given us everything. He's given us life. Now, why are we created? Why were we created? It says here, we are his workmanship, which is, which is the result of him working in us. We are, he's worked with us. He's, he's made us. We are created in Christ Jesus unto good works. When you get saved, when you put your faith on the Lord Jesus Christ, that's not the end. That should just be the very beginning. That is the start. That is the start of a new life and as the start of your new life to do and to serve God that God has ordained that you should walk in them. Now, this, ver you know, this verse is not saying that if you don't do good works, you're not saved. It already said that salvation is not of works. But the whole point, and that's why I say it's all about soul winning. It's not just all about getting saved. It's all about doing the work after you're saved and getting other people saved. That's what the whole point is. The point of our life is to be, to be, because we're created unto good works. And what greater work is there than leading another soul unto Jesus Christ and showing them how they can also have eternal life? That's the great, that is the greatest work that I think anybody can do in this world. I mean, that's the biggest event in my life, personally, the, the moment that I put my faith in Jesus Christ and, and was no longer hell-bound, but heaven-bound. I mean, that is the single number one most important event that happened in my personal life. And if you're saved this morning, I would be willing to bet it's the number one most important event that happened in your life as well. And God has graced us with the ability to, to have a part in that as believers, to help other people find that free gift, to, to help other people be pointed to the Savior, to Jesus Christ. And we have the honor of being involved in that process Turn, if you would, to Colossians chapter 1. Just a, just a few pages to the right in your Bible, Colossians chapter 1. We're going to look in verse number 16. The Bible says, For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, Visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. Look at this next phrase. All things were created by him and for him. God created all things. Jesus created all things. They were, everything was created by him and for him. So again, the purpose for our existence, according to the Bible, according to God, is for God's purpose. It's not just for our own purpose. It's not just to, to fulfill the lusts of our flesh and just go on vacations, do everything. That is not why we're here. Now, that is why most people, that is what most people spend their time on. They waste their life doing just other things that gratify the flesh. But that is not why God created us. That is not the purpose of our life is just to go off and have fun. Now, it's not a sin to have fun sometimes. We do it. You know, everybody does that. You need to blow off some steam. You need to relieve some stress sometimes. But that is not the purpose of our life. We have goals. We have purposes that God has laid out for us. And we were created for him, not for ourselves. Look at verse 17. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. Verse 18. He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. Now I'm going to pause here real quick. The Bible says here that Christ is the head of the body or of the church. And I'll just ask you, is Christ the head of this church this morning? Head means he's in charge. Head means he's the authority. If we want to say, and look, I don't know any church that's going to say Jesus Christ is not the head of this church. I don't know any church that's going to say that. So I know right now you're thinking, of course Jesus is the head of our church. 
But what I want you to think is, is he really the authority figure? I mean, think, think about it this way. There's, you know, the Bible says that, the, that the, the husband is the head of the wife and that in the home, the husband's to be in charge. Okay, that's what the Bible says. Is that the way it is in every home? No, of course not. Especially these days. Jesus Christ is supposed to be the head of this church. If he really is the authority, then we ought to be looking to him for, for everything, for what we're supposed to be doing with our life, for, for how we're supposed to be serving him. And if he really is the head, then we need to recognize that we were created for him and not for ourselves. We need to, to acknowledge his, his authority and his headship over this church. And by doing so, then we do what he's telling us to do. When Jesus Christ tells us we ought to do something like preach the gospel of every creature, then we ought to be doing that. And if we're not doing that, then we're usurping his authority. We're just, we're, we're thinking it's not that important. And you could, you, could, you could apply that to anything. You could apply that to anything that Jesus says or that the Bible says of what we should be doing. If he's really going to be the head, if we're going to treat God as being God, as being God of our lives, as being Lord, then we ought to be listening to him. And, and I mean... I believe that Jesus Christ is the head of this church, but you know, the church is not just one person. It's not just the pastor. It's not just one person. It's all of us. So in order for Jesus Christ to be the head of the church, he's got to be head over all of us. We all got to be on the same page here. We all got to have the same goals, and those goals ought to all be found here in, in the instructions given to us here. We could all be in unity for any other cause. I mean, there's lots of organizations and groups out there that can be unified for different causes. But Jesus Christ isn't the head of all those organizations. Jesus Christ is the head of this organization, of this church. And we ought to be in unity underneath that headship. Let's keep reading here, verse number 19. The Bible says, For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself. By him, I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. And you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled. Again, a testimony to the amazing grace that God has. That even you that were sometime alienated and enemies, in your mind to God, that we were made enemies to God by our wicked works. Yet now hath he reconciled. He's, he, he's established a way to bring us back to him, to make things okay, to smooth it over, that, that all the transgressions and the wicked works that we've done in this life, that God is able to look past that because he's looking to Jesus who, who paid for our sins. Verse 22, in the body of his flesh through death, to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. The goal is to present us holy, unblameable, unreprovable unto good works, as we saw in Ephesians chapter 2, that we're, that we're doing what we're supposed to be doing and we could be unblameable, unreprovable. Verse number 23, if you continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you have heard and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. Now, this is a great claim. The Apostle Paul is saying, look, this gospel was preached to every creature which is under heaven. It didn't happen from Paul alone. There was a lot of people going out and preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. We had the apostles, you had the Apostle Paul, and you also had disciples. You had other people that aren't even mentioned in the Bible that were going out and making sure that the gospel was being preached to everyone. This is a great task, but he was able to say in Scripture that, the gospel, that it was preached to every creature which is under heaven. Verse 24, We now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church, whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God, even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his, saints, to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory, whom we preach, 
warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Whereunto I also labor, striving according to his working, which worketh in me mightily. Now, it's not just, Paul's long gone, but this work still needs to be done. We can't rely on the Apostle Paul to be going out and doing the work that he already did. He's gone. Jesus Christ was on this earth. He was doing this work. He was preaching the gospel to the poor. He was doing so many good works and healing people and telling people the truth. Jesus Christ is not walking around the earth anymore these days. But we are. And the, the, the torch has been passed to us as believers to make sure that this work continues unto this day. We need to preach Jesus Christ. We need to warn every man. The Bible said, Jesus Christ himself said that the whole law weighs on these two commandments, that you should love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and that you love your neighbor as yourself. Those are the two great commandments. The second great commandment, loving your neighbor as yourself. If you knew that if you, and you do know, if you know that a person that does not have their faith in Jesus Christ is going to spend an eternity being burned and tortured and tormented in darkness and pain, weeping and wailing, if you know that that's true, do you really love your neighbor when you don't warn them that that's what's going to happen? Do you care about them at all? Is there any love? Can you say, yes, I love my neighbor as myself? As much as I don't want to face that torturous torment and punishment, I'm going to let everyone else know. Yeah, it makes people uncomfortable to talk about it. But if you were headed to hell, wouldn't, wouldn't you rather have a little bit of discomfort in a social situation and hear the truth? Then for everyone just to pretend like everything's okay, everything's just fine, let's have small talk and talk about the weather and talk about sports until the day that we die, and then, well, I'm going to heaven because I put my faith in Jesus, and my neighbor's going to hell, and I just never thought to mention it one time. What a day. And you know, we're going to see on the great white throne judgment when people are going to be cast into that burning, fiery furnace, what are you going to be thinking? I mean, hey, if you're, you're born again this morning, you're saved. You know, there's nothing that's going to change that. Praise God for that. But what's going to be going through your head when you see people being cast into a lake of fire that you knew, that you knew personally, and that you never once brought up the gospel of Jesus Christ to? What a shame that's going to be. I think there's going to be a lot of, of, of weeping and tears at that day over the, the sorrow for, for what could have been. When things finally become real. Because it's easy to be distracted in this life. It's easy not to think about these things. It's easy to think about the day-to-day -day routine, to think about work, to be distracted with entertainment, and just let everything else come to the forefront of our mind. The Bible says we need to walk by faith and not by sight. Faith tells us Heaven is real. We can't see heaven today. Faith tells us hell is real. We don't see hell today. We don't see the souls that are already there. We don't see it. We can see it through the lens of faith, though, because the Bible talks a lot about both places. And when we're keeping that in the forefront, when we're walking by our faith, we ought to remember what a horrible place hell is so that we can be prompted to let other people know about that, to warn people as the Apostle Paul did, whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. That's the goal. That's the work. That is the labor that needs to be done. As he said, whereunto I also labor, striving according to his working, which worketh in me mightily. This is the labor that, that's, that we need to do. And look, this church isn't for everybody. I'll say that right off, off, off the bat, but if you want to actually get off your rear end and do something for the Lord and not just give God lip service, then this is the right place. Because we're a church that's going to go out and do the things that the Bible says that we need to do. Because we really want to have respect for the Lord Jesus Christ and for his words and for the commands that are given to us. 
Yes, we're going to try to keep ourselves unspotted from the world. We're going to, we're going to do our best to obey the commandments. But you know what? You, could, you can keep yourself unspotted. You could study the Bible every single day. You could have all wisdom and all knowledge and have all prophecies and all understanding. And you could have all spiritual gifts. But you know what? It's nothing if you don't go out and preach the gospel. 1 Corinthians 13, I was paraphrasing from that, is about charity. What is charity? It's caring for other people. I don't care how much scripture you know, you don't know anything if you don't go out and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. It does, because what good does it do? What does it profit? It's just like James 2 when it talks about the guy, you know, when someone comes to you, they're naked and hungry. You could have all this knowledge on everything that they ought to do, and if you don't share any of that with them, then what good is it going to do them? Nothing. You could have all this knowledge about the Lord and Jesus Christ and everything else. What good does that do the person who's going to die and go to hell unless you go and warn them and tell them about it? Nothing. You could be the most perfect, you know, as sinless as possible Christian on the face of this earth, and if you don't go out and warn other people about it, it does no good. There's no profit to it. Turn, if you would, to 2 Corinthians chapter number 5. I'm going to read for you from 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Just something for you to, to, to consider and to chew on for a minute. Because the Bible tells us that God gives everybody a minister in order for them to believe. Because God wants everyone to be saved. God has commanded for each individual person to have a minister that can share the gospel to them in order for them to believe. This is, this is quote, I'm going to quote 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse number 4. The Bible says, For while one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are you not carnal? Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos, but ministers by whom ye believed, even as the Lord gave to every man? That's where I'm getting my statements from. The Lord gave to every man ministers by whom they might believe. God has also given us free will. He's given us instructions. He's given us commands. He's given us the, the instruction to preach the gospel. But it's up to us to obey him. We have been committed to the, the ministry of reconciliation. We're going to get to that in just a second. God gives the orders. He sends out these ministers. But does everybody listen to God? No. I wonder how many people will end up going to hell because their minister didn't obey God's call to preach the gospel. You are somebody's minister. You are. God has someone that can get saved by you giving them the gospel. He's appointed you to give the gospel to people and there's somebody out there that would get saved if you gave them the gospel. And this is very important to understand. There are many people in this world. And if just one person was the one giving the gospel to everybody, not everyone's going to listen to that person. There's, there's people that just because of the way I look won't want to talk to me. There are people of different ethnicities that refuse to talk to white people or black people or whatever. I mean, that's just the way that some people are. But that doesn't mean that they deserve to go to hell. See, God has given ministers to everybody. There's different people that will listen to other people more than others. There's other people that have a better way of explaining things than others, that, that people just connect. It's, it's, it's the way that we're made. There's different personality types. There's different types of people. God needs all of us to be ministers, to minister his word, to, that, that he could send you to, to specific people that might only listen to you. And you don't know who those people are necessarily which is why we need to offer up ourselves to just go out and do what he says and, and let him do the leading. Let him do the guiding, but we are going to offer up ourselves servants unto him. It's our reasonable service. The Bible says to, to offer up yourself a living sacrifice to God, which is your reasonable service. I mean, he bought you with the blood of Jesus Christ. He bought and paid for your soul. It's only right that we should be able to, to work for him and, and willingly work for him and offer up our services to God. Say, God, I'm humbled by the sense that you, you love me enough to pay for all my sins. What can I do for you? How about you lead someone else to, to Christ? That's what he wants more than anything. 
More souls to be saved from the damnation of hell. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, look at verse number 5. The Bible says, Now he that hath wrought us for the self, self same thing is God, who also hath given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. Therefore we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing rather, to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Wherefore we labor. Verse 9, labor, that's work. The Christian life is not just about sitting around and being lazy and hanging out with friends and just eating food. Wherefore we labor that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Now, Don't mistake what, this verse is, what these verses are saying. That's why I started reading in context, starting up at verse number five, explaining that God has already given us the earnest of the Spirit. We already know that, that when we're in our body, we're absent from the Lord. We already know that we're saved. So what this is talking about when he says, we labor that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. This isn't talking about just being accepted into heaven of like you have to do good works in order to be saved. That's not what this is talking about at all. This is just talking about, hey, do you want to be a son in the sight of God or a daughter that's acceptable in his eyes? Right? I mean, my, my children, they're all my children. They're all born into my family. I'm their father. They're my kids. Nothing's going to change that. But there's a certain way that they can live to where I would say that's acceptable. Acceptable behavior. They're accepted by me. No matter what, they're my children. This is what he's talking about. We're children of God by, by grace through faith. But as many as that believe on him, to them gave you power to become the sons of God, even them that believe on his name. Um, the Bible says that we are children of God just by, by putting faith in him. But if we want to be acceptable and accepted by God, we need to be laboring. We need to be working. We need to be doing something that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. Verse number 10, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. And again, the things that we do are important. You're saved. Yeah, you're going to heaven. But there is a judgment seat of Christ where God is, you're going to be standing before Jesus Christ and everything that you've done in this world is going to come up before him. Now just think about that. Before we even get to the judgment part of what, he's, of what happens, remember that. How confident are you? How, how you know, when, you, when you're standing before Jesus and all of your works now come before him, are you going to be embarrassed because you've wasted your life on, on just meaningless things, on just accumulating wealth and money and, and going on vacations and going, you know, whatever, whatever, whatever it may be that you've just, just here's my life's work. And then it just gets burned up. It's better to go confident before the judgment seat of Christ, knowing, hey, you know, I know I'm not perfect. I know I've made mistakes. I know I've missed opportunities. I don't do everything right. But I have done work for Jesus. I have gone out and, and, and led people to Christ. I have done things that actually matter, that have eternal value. I have done it. And if you could go with that confidence, at least you know, um, you know you're much better standing and you, can, you could come before him being accepted of him. Look at verse number um, 11. It says, Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. We need to persuade people. Hell is real. The, punish, the judgment of God is real. We, need, we know that there is a terror of the Lord which is extreme fear, and we need to persuade people. We need to persuade men to get saved. Verse number 12, For we commend not ourselves again unto you, but give you occasion to glory on our behalf, that ye may have somewhat to answer them, which glory in appearance and not in heart. For whether we be beside ourselves, it is to God, or whether we be sober, it is for your cause. For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge, that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And that he died for all, 
that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Again, did you need more scripture to tell you what you should be doing with your life and what you should be focused on? Verse 15, that he died, Jesus died for all. For that reason, because Jesus died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves. People want to look at the pastor and say, well, of course, yeah, the pastor needs to be going out and doing this work. The pastor needs to do this. The pastor needs to do that. Are you saved? Did Jesus die for you? Then you henceforth should not be living unto yourself. It's not just the pastor who shouldn't be living unto himself. It's everybody. Every believer should not be living for themselves, but should be, should be living to the service of Jesus Christ. Unto him which died for them and rose again. Wherefore henceforth know we no man after the flesh. Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. And, hath, and look at this. And hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. God reconciled us. He made things right between us and him. See, we're born into this world. We don't have any sin of our own, right? When we understand the law and we sin against God, we're condemned. We deserve hell. When we put our faith in Jesus Christ, all the sins that we've done or ever will do have been pardoned and now we are reconciled back with God. And the only way that we could be reconciled to God is, is because of Jesus, through Jesus Christ. And he's given to us the ministry. Ministry means you're serving other people. That's what, a min what when you're a minister, you're doing something for somebody else. You're working for someone else. You're ministering to another person. We have this ministry of reconciliation, verse 19, to wit, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. Jesus Christ, when he was on this earth, he was reconciling people to God. He had the power of God in him. And he preached to the people. But since Christ isn't here, he's made us his ambassador. Christ is in heaven. We are here representing the Lord Jesus Christ, trying to reconcile the world to him. We are here to make people understand that there's a free gift of salvation for them and, and to point them to that reconciliation. It's been committed to us. It, which means it's, it's entrusted to us. God's trusting you to give the gospel to people. We can't let God down. The consequences are dire. If we let God down in this area, yeah, you're still going to go to heaven. But a lot more people are going to end up going to hell if you're not doing your part. Our church is very small. But we can get a lot of things done, even with a small number of people. But I tell you what, for an area, this greater area that's got, you know, over 100,000 people population-wise in our Quad City area, to, I mean, about 100 people per year being led to, to, led to Jesus Christ, that's not that much. Now, it's a lot when you consider how little, how few people are actually going out and doing this work or involved in this work. It's great. It, it, it's, 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 it's a great blessing. But how much more can be reached? And look, I know not everybody's going to get saved. We know that. People have free will. But there's so many people out there, and I know this because I run across them almost on a weekly basis, that are ready to get saved, that they want to be saved, they just don't know how because no one's ever explained it to them before. I can't tell you, and Brother Sebastian will testify to this, how many people say, I've never heard that before. No one's ever explained that to me before. They can be going to church their entire life and no one has ever explained the concept of a free gift. 
And the concept, it's so simple, it's so easily understood, but so many people never heard it before. And it's a shame and a tragedy that in the United States of America, supposedly a Christian nation, people have not heard the true gospel. It's because people have gotten lazy. and They don't want to do the work and they're distracted with all the cares of this world. Well, this church isn't lazy. We're not going to be lazy. As long as I'm pastoring here, I'm going to push everybody a little bit to not be lazy. Okay? Because Christ is worth it. I don't know about you, but I know, I know in my life it, it, was, it was worth it. Any second, every last second that I give to do, to do his work, it's, it's, it's nothing compared to my soul being saved. It's nothing. And we need, we need to, to keep a healthy attitude and, and to, to put the most important thing first. Now, we obviously teach and study and do, a, there's a lot more things involved in our life in general, but the, the number one thing ought to be soul winning. It ought to be reaching people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. In, uh, in Acts chapter 5, verse number 40, the Bible says, And to him they agreed, and when they had called the apostles and beaten them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. And they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. The apostles we read about in the book of Acts over and over again, being beaten, thrown in prison, having all kinds of obstacles in their way to just preaching Jesus Christ. We don't have those obstacles in our path today. It is legal and lawful for us, according to this world's government, to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. It wasn't always legal for them to do that in different areas and different places they were preaching the gospel, and it's not legal in many areas today. We have opportunity here what a shame to just blow it and not use it. I mean, I'm, I get so sick of hearing all the excuses why people can't preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And they're all lame. I don't care what you're, it's, it's all lame. I don't care if you're scared. I don't care if, if your knee hurts. I don't care if you, whatever. People have, have all these different things, all these reasons why I can't preach the gospel to somebody. Now look, if you're physically incapacitated from being able to go door to door, I understand that, but you can still give the gospel to people, especially in today's age. I mean, with technology, you can talk to people on the phone. You have to come into some kind of contact with people on some type of regular basis. What about talking to those people? Look, we need to keep this at the forefront of our minds. And in Acts chapter 5, I only read the first two verses there to get it in context, how they were beaten in front of the council, like, they were, imagine being brought before the governor or the mayor, or like any people who are in charge, have authority, and having them just whip you and say, stop preaching Jesus. Sounds kind of scary. They left there rejoicing, and then you know what the next verse says, very famous verse, and daily in the temple and in every house, they ceased not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. That didn't stop them. So what's stopping you? These people were just men. They were fishermen. They were tax collectors. They were, they were regular guys with regular jobs that Jesus called to follow him and to be his disciples. There is no reason that anyone here today can't be like them. It's you that's going to hold yourself back. But God doesn't want you. God wants to use you. If they weren't held back, even by beatings, what is it that's preventing you from sharing the gospel with people? What is it? I'm going to close with this because we need to we need to understand the emphasis of the gospel. 
The word gospel is found 104 times in the Bible. All in the New Testament. I'm going to read for you every single verse that references the word gospel. And I want you to think about these verses. Now, the, the context changes a little bit, but, but I want you to be able to walk away with the importance that the Bible places on the gospel. And it might sound, of course, there's importance on it, but, but seriously listen to these verses as I read them and let them sink in. Because this is the, the primary, this is why we gather together. This is why we meet as a church. This is why we study our Bibles. This is why we get sin out of our lives is so that we can preach the gospel and be the most effective use of the Lord to, to win people to Christ. This is what it's all about. Matthew chapter 4, verse 23, the Bible says, And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. Matthew 9, 35, And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. Now think about this, right? Jesus Christ is supposed to be our example. He's our model. He's who we're supposed to be following. If you're going to say that you're going to be a disciple of Jesus Christ or a Christian, someone who's like Christ, that's what the word literally means, a Christian, are you preaching the gospel like Jesus Christ did? Because that's the example that he left us. Matthew eleven five. 5, the blind receive their sight and the lame walk. The lepers are cleansed and the, the deaf hear and the dead are raised up and the poor have the gospel preached to them. Matthew 24, 14. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations and then shall the end come. Matthew 26, 13. Verily I say unto you, wheresoever this gospel shall be preached in the whole world, there shall also this that this woman hath done be told of a memorial of her. Mark 1.1, 1, 1. starting off the, the very first verse in the book of Mark, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Mark 1.14, now after that John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. Mark 1.15, and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. Mark 8.35, for whosoever shall have, will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospels, the same shall save it. Jesus Christ just put up, whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospels. Jesus' sake and the gospel's sake on the same level. Mark 10, 29, And Jesus answered and said, Verily I say unto you, There is no man that hath left house, or brethren, or sisters, or mother, or father, or wife, or children, or lands, for my sake and the gospels. For my sake and the gospels. Mark 13, 10, And the gospel must, be fir must first be published among all nations. Mark 14, 9, Verily I say unto you, Wheresoever this gospel shall be preached throughout the whole world, this also that she hath done shall be spoken of a memorial for her. Mark 16, 15, And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. It's a great commission. Luke 4, 18. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and the recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. Luke 7, 22. Then Jesus answering said unto them, Go your way and tell John what things you have seen and heard, how that the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised. To the poor, the gospel is preached. Luke 9, 6. And they departed and went through the towns preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. Preaching the gospel everywhere. Luke 20, verse 1, And it came to pass that on one of those days, as he taught the people in the temple and preached the gospel, the chief priests and the scribes came upon him with the elders. Acts 8, 25, And they, when they had testified and preached the word of the Lord, returned to Jerusalem and preached the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. Acts 14, 7, And there they preached the gospel. Acts 14, 21, And when they had preached the gospel to that city and had taught many, they returned again to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch. Acts 15, 7, And when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said unto them, Men and brethren, ye know how that a good while ago God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. Acts 16.10, And after he had seen the vision, immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us for to preach the gospel unto them. 
Acts 20, 24, But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus Christ to testify the gospel of the grace of God. This is the attitude that we ought to have. I don't count my life as dear unto myself, but that I might do the work of preaching the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 1.1, 1, 1, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated under the gospel of God. Romans 1.9, for God is my witness whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers. Romans 1.15, so as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Are you ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ? If you're not, when's the last time you've, you've given the gospel to anybody? And just ask yourself, why have I not? Why haven't I? If you're embarrassed to give somebody the gospel of Jesus Christ, you're ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the bottom line. If you say, oh, I'm uncomfortable, oh, I, I, I don't think, I don't want to say this because I don't know how, the, are you, you're ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's the bottom line. There's no nice way of putting it. We ought not to be ashamed of the very thing that saved our soul. There's nothing to be ashamed about or embarrassed about. That's just the world trying to convince you that, oh, religion's a taboo subject. You can't talk about that. Well, it's the exact opposite of what the Bible tells us to do. Romans 2.16, in, in the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. Romans 10.15, and how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Romans 10, of course, that famous passage that says, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. People get saved by hearing the word of God by preachers being sent to preach the gospel. But they have not all obeyed the gospel, for Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? Romans eleven twenty eight. As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes, but as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sakes. Romans fifteen sixteen. That I should be the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God, that the offering up of Gentiles might be acceptable, being sanctified by the Holy Ghost. Romans fifteen nineteen. Through mighty signs and wonders, by the Spirit of, by the power of the Spirit of God. So that from Jerusalem and round about unto Illyricum, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. Romans 15, 20. Yea, so have I strived to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named, lest I should build upon another man's foundation. Romans 15, 29. And I am sure that when I come unto you, I shall come in the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Christ. Romans 16, 25. Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began. 1 Corinthians 1.17 For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Not with words of wisdom, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. And this is a good verse to mem have memorized or to, to know where it is to point to the people like the Pentecostals who think that you need to be baptized in order to be saved. That they think baptism is part of your salvation. 1 Corinthians 1.17 is what I just referenced there. Christ sent me not to baptize. So you're saying the Apostle Paul was, is an evangelist. He was sent to preach the gospel, right? He was sent for people to get saved. So if baptism is a part of salvation, then why does he say Christ sent me not to baptize, right? It's, I mean, it's a real powerful verse to show people just the, 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 the ignorance of the belief that, that baptism is a requirement. He says, he didn't send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. That's why he was sent. That was Paul's mission. Preach the gospel. 1 Corinthians 4.15 For though ye have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have ye not many fathers. For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. 1 Corinthians 9.12 If others be partakers of this power over you, are not we rather? Nevertheless, we have not used this power, but suffer all things, lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ. He's concerned everything is about, you know, about getting the gospel out, not hindering it, not not letting it get backed up for one second. We don't want to do anything to hinder the work. 1 Corinthians 9, 14, Even so hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. Verse 16, For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of. For necessity is laid upon me, yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. 
Necessity is laid upon us to preach the gospel. We have been committed with that task. And, and woe unto us if we don't do it. For if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. What is my reward then? Verily, that when I preach the gospel, I may make the gospel of Christ without charge, that I abuse not my power in the gospel. Verse 23, and this I do for the gospel's sake, that I might be partaker thereof with you. 1 Corinthians 15, 1, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received and wherein you stand. 2 Corinthians 2, 12, Furthermore, when I came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel, and a door was opened unto me of the Lord. 2 Corinthians 4, 3, But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. And again, another tragedy. You're already saved, but the gospel is hid to them that are lost. 2 Corinthians 4, 4, In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. And for, uh, 2 Corinthians 8, 18, And we have sent with him the brother whose praise is in the gospel throughout all the churches. Chapter 9, verse 13, Whilst by the ex experiment of this ministration they glorify God for your professed subjection unto the gospel of Christ and for your liberal distribution unto them and unto all men. 2 Corinthians 10, 14, For we stretch not ourselves beyond our measure as though we reached not unto you. For we are come as far as to you also in preaching the gospel of Christ. Verse 16, to preach the gospel in the regions beyond you and not to boast in another man's line of things made ready to our hand. Chapter 11, verse 4, for if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit which ye have not received, or another gospel which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with them. And this is another important reason why we need to be going out and preaching the gospel because there's a lot of other people that are preaching other gospels out there today. You've got Mormons going door to door. You've got Jehovah's Witnesses going door to door. You even have the Potter's House going door to door. And they all have perverted gospels. Whether they don't believe that Jesus Christ was God in the flesh, they all believe that you have to work your way to heaven. We literally were just talking to a Potter's House. And look, this is indicative of every, every Potter's House person we ever talked to. It's, well, yeah, you're saved by grace through faith. And they say this over and over again. But... You have to keep your salvation by doing the works. And we're trying to explain, well, how, why would that even be the case? I mean, we don't deserve it to begin with. God's giving us to it for free. Now, all of a sudden, after you get saved, you're, you're just commanded to just keep the whole law in order to be saved? It doesn't make any sense. And, you know, uh, Brother Special did a good job of, of giving her the, the truth, you know, with humility and in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. Because she literally opposed herself and was just, contradicting and couldn't even see the contradiction. But it's for this reason, there's so many people deceived out there, why it's incumbent and so much more important for us who know the truth, who know the simplicity of the gospel, to share the gospel with people. People need to hear it. They're being inundated with every other false way. And those that truly believe that, that have the right gospel, most of them aren't doing anything. How are you going to have victory when no one's doing the work? Verse 7 here, 2 Corinthians eleven seven. 7. Have I committed an offense in abasing myself that ye might be exalted because I have preached to you the gospel of God freely? Galatians 1, 6. I marvel that ye are so, so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we are an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which ye have, we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. That's in Galatians 1. Verse number 11. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. Galatians 2, 2. And I went up by revelation and communicated unto them that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles but privately to them which are of reputation, lest by any means I should run or had run in vain. The Apostle Paul is preaching the gospel to everybody. He's saying, you know what? And some people, I'm, I'll preach it unto them privately and other people publicly. Why? Because the whole goal, he, you know, he is quoted as saying, you know, I would become all things to all men that I might by all means save some. So if some people are embarrassed in a public setting, you know what? Yeah, take them in private, but either way, preach the gospel to them. That's what matters the most. 
regardless of the setting or the situation. Hey, if some people are going to be made uncomfortable in this situation, let's get them in another situation where they're more comfortable and, and, and talk to them. And that's why it's also important, you know, we go out soul winning and we knock on people's doors. Not everyone's going to be receptive to that. We also need to be talking to people in our personal life, coworkers, other people, every opportunity you have to give the gospel to people because you got you to catch them at the right time and in, and in a setting where they're not going to reject it. Some people, you know what? Some people do reject it at the door, but that's not going to make us stop from doing it. Some people reject you in your personal life. That shouldn't make you stop from talking to other people in your personal life. Don't let any perceived failures discourage you from doing any of the work. And I'll tell you what, it's not a failure anyways. If you're preaching the gospel, guys, it's not a failure. When you bear the precious seed, weeping, you doubtless shall come again rejoicing, bringing your sheaves with you. That's what the Bible says, that, that there, there is benefit. God's word does not, does not, you know, when it goes out, it's powerful and it, and it will not return void. Everyone has a choice to make in their own life, but we need to let God's word have the power that it has and just, we need to be the messenger and not be the judge. The judge says, oh, I don't want to give the gospel to this person. Oh, they won't listen to me. The obedient servant just says, well, I'm told to give the gospel to every creature, so I'm just going to do it. Galatians 2.5, to whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. Verse 7, but contrarywise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter, verse 14, but when I saw that they walked not uprightly, uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all, if thou being a Jew livest after the manner of Gentiles and not as do the Jews, why compel us all the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? Again, this, this was a cause. They weren't walking according to the truth of the gospel because the gospel is so important that the apostle Paul didn't want people to be confused. He had to confront the apostle Peter to his face and say, look, why are you now following the Jews law instead of walking the way of the gospel? Which is that there is neither Jew nor Gentile. There is neither Greek, you know, Greek nor Jew. There is neither male nor female, bond nor free in Christ Jesus because we are all one in Christ Jesus. And, and this is what he was explaining to even the apostle Peter who was wrong and needed to be rebuked. Why did he stand up and rebuke him to his face publicly? Because he was walking contrary to the gospel. Because the gospel is that important. That that needs to be, you have to make a stand on that. You have to be able to call people out when, when they're doing things against the gospel of Jesus Christ. Galatians 3.8 In the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. And again, that's just proving that the God, even though all of our references are in the New Testament, because that word gospel is only used in the, in the New Testament, the gospel has been around through all time. It says in Galatians 3.8 that preached before the gospel unto Abraham. Abraham was preached the gospel. Moses was preached the gospel. Why? Because they believed God. They believed on the Lord for their salvation. Faith is what saved them. It's always been that way. There are no different methods of salvation in different time periods. It's always been by grace through faith. Always. And it always will be. Verse uh, Galatians 4.13 You know how through infirmity of the flesh I preached the gospel unto you at the first. The Apostle Paul, through infirmity of the flesh, he had problems. He had reasons to quit and to back out. And, oh, I don't feel like doing this. No, even through his infirmity, he still preached the gospel. And this is what's so important. We need to not be wimps today. We need to not let every little thing keep us out from preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, and you know, this is very telling. You think about this in your own life. And I use, I use this example for myself because of how dedicated I am to my job and to doing work. But think about in your life what you're dedicated to doing. Whatever it is, right? It, it could be anything. Anything that you just really value really high where it's like, I'm going to make sure that I make it to my job or whatever. And if I'm sick, I'll work through it. Think about that. What type of commitment do you have to that? And then compare that to preaching the gospel. When you set aside a time and say, you know what? I'm going to dedicate this time to serving the Lord. Oh, but I've got the, I'm a little bit achy today. I've got the sniffles, so I'm not going to go out and do it. 
Is that keeping you out when you would, when under the same conditions, you'd go out and do anything else? You go out and say, oh, well, we've got our vacation schedule. Well, you know, I'm going to fly in this plane and I'm going to go on our vacation. Because we already paid for it. We already, you know, I've already invested my money into it. So even though I'm not feeling very well, I'm going to go out and do it. Do you feel the same way about preaching the gospel? Just remember that. I mean, think about that. How important is it to you? And how important should it be to you? You, you make up your own mind on that. I'm just, I'm just bringing it up. Ephesians 1, we're almost done. Ephesians 1, 13, In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Ephesians 3, 6, That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. Ephesians 6, 15, And your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. I'm about the armor of God. One piece of the armor of God is your feet being shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. That is one piece of your armor that God says you need to have in order for you to go out and preach the gospel. Ephesians 6, 19. And for me, that utterance may be given unto me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. The apostle Paul is speaking this while he's in prison. Pray for me. He's already preached the gospel boldly enough to be cast into prison, and now he's still saying, you know what, pray that, that I'll still retain my boldness, that even though I'm in prison, I can still go out and preach the gospel because it's that important. Because the gospel is so important that you need to be willing to sacrifice yourself going to jail or being beheaded for it. Let's face it, the time is coming, and we know that it's coming. When people are going to be martyred for their faith in Jesus Christ, and you cannot let that shake you even unto death. This is the commitment that God wants from us. That we are willing to stand for the gospel of Jesus. People have done it throughout, throughout history and praise God for them. Because by their works and their efforts, people continue to get saved and, and throughout, you know, just throughout history. Philippians 1.5, for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, it continues on. Verse number seven, even as it is meet for me to think this of you all because I have you in my heart and as much as both in my bonds and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you, are all, you all are partakers of my grace. Philippians 1.12, but I would you should understand, brethren, that the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather under the furtherance of the gospel. Verse 17, but the other of love, knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. Verse 27, only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that ye stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Philippians 2.22, but ye know the proof of him that as a son with the father, he hath served with me in the gospel. Philippians 4, 3, And I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, help those women which labored with me in the gospel, and with Clement also, and with other my fellow laborers whose names are in the book of life. Philippians 4, 15, Now ye Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. I've got a whole other page. I'm not going to do all of these. I said I was going to, but it's just going on and on, and I think you're getting the point. Okay, I've got a whole nother page of just references to the gospel. It's important. And, and hopefully this underscores, how, I mean, how often, and that's why I just, just pulled out this word, all the verses, and just found every time it's mentioned to just underscore the importance of the gospel and how primary this is to our faith and, and, and how it ought to be in our lives. I want to kick off our soul winning surge with, with people being excited about preaching the gospel, with people feeling compelled that, hey, you know what, I haven't been doing this, but I want to do this. Come out with us. Talk to me. I, if, if the times that we have scheduled do not work for you, I am willing to work with anyone's schedule to the best of my ability. I have a pretty flexible schedule, and I could make time a part that will work for you. Don't let that be your, of all things, don't let that be your stumbling block. Oh, well, it's not convenient with the time. You know what? I'll make it convenient. 
Whatever works, I will find a way to make sure that, that somebody can go out soul winning with you, if not myself personally. We all got saved as a result of hearing God's word preached. We need to, in turn, be ministers that will preach the gospel and help other people to get saved. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for the wonderful gospel that you've given to us, dear Lord, that the free gift of salvation. Lord, we, we love you. It's easy to get distracted in this life. It's easy to just to, to get busy with everything else. And, and things, Lord, sometimes they're important in our life, but ultimately most of the things that we do, we probably, it's not as important as we might, we might think they are. God, help us stir up our spirits to, to be convicted enough to, to dedicate time to serving you in this manner, in, in the manner of, of serving others, being ministers unto other people, people that we don't even know, Lord, to, to preach the gospel to them, that they might be saved as we are, Lord. We ask for your blessing upon our church. I pray that you please fill us with boldness. Help us to be able to, to go out and boldly proclaim your word. And, uh, and help us to just be unified in this faith here at Word of Truth Baptist Church, dear Lords. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.